Good job. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good to see you here on this holiday weekend. Uh, but we know that it's far more than a holiday. In, in a lot of ways, this is a holy day. Uh, Memorial Day weekend stands for those who gave their lives in service to their country that we might continue to be free. And so we are grateful to be together on this Memorial Day weekend, and I'm glad to see you here. I know that there are probably, probably some travelers out there and so forth, but we are together today. Amen? Amen. Good to have you here, see you here. We're going to start with just a few announcements, and then we'll move on into worship service today. You'll notice that there are two meetings taking place this week in your bulletin, ESL, English Second Language, taking place. Okay, so that class is done. Uh, till the fall. Thank you, Don. Uh, but the grief support group does go on at 10 o'clock this Thursday morning, if you're a part of that. Uh, also, uh, as we gather here to worship, some beautiful flowers in front of me today, given in memory of Lieutenant Robert Duncan and Lieutenant Al Ashall, given by Joan Stanley, and uh, uh, they were his friends. Uh, Vietnam War and he just told me the fact that he was to fly a mission and they were to fly a mission and it got reversed so that they got each other's and those guys never came back uh, and so by God's providence and grace Joan Stanley is here today but these two have gone on before us and so we remember them in a special way thanking God for their uh, giving their lives for the service of their country that we might continue to be free today to worship so Jones thank you for remembering your two friends and the beautiful flowers here uh, also next Sunday you have a potential candidate speaking I think uh, Stan is going to make an announcement about that uh, also please get this on your calendar now it's so very important vacation Bible school is starting up Sunday, June 11th through Thursday, June 15th, 6 o'clock to 8.30 in the evening, and volunteers are still needed. So there are volunteer forms. Please do sign up. Do not allow Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy to take place of Vacation Bible School. You hear me, didn't you? I mean it. I'm serious about it. Don't let Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune take place of that. Sir? It is a game show theme, so come here. Uh, and uh, if you can volunteer, we would love to have you. If you can serve one night or all of the nights, we would love to have you here. Please do sign up for that. Also, June 11th is a special day in that it's the second Sunday of the month, so there will be breakfast here as well as we will celebrate the Lord's Supper on that Sunday morning of June 11th. Uh, business meeting is not going to happen this month. It has been postponed on to uh, August 9th because it falls in the middle of Vacation Bible School Week. So I think that's all the announcements except Stan. I know you have one that you want to make, so come on up and uh, we'll proceed into worship after your announcement. Good morning. Good morning, all. Thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. What a great day to be here. I uh, wanted to take just a, just a few minutes to uh, uh, talk about the search team and our process. And, and just to make sure we're, we're very clear on, on our search. Uh, as I'm sure you realize, we've, uh, uh, you know, the, the first step in that process, essentially, uh, after we've posted for resumes, we, we, at the point of receiving a resume, we, the candidate or the applicant, I want to, want to, change some language here and start using applicant instead of candidate. Uh, so the candidate or the applicant has, uh, has submitted a resume. The team has, has reviewed that resume. We've, we've uh, taken a look at experience, education, probably have listened to a sermon. Uh, you know, doing all the things to pray over and to determine if this is uh, uh, an applicant that we want to go further with. So, uh, so the next step could be a phone interview and, and potentially uh, to invite that candidate or an applicant to, uh, to do a meet and greet type meeting so we can get to know them a little bit. Uh, along the way in there, we're, we're reviewing some references, whatever might be uh, submitted by the applicant 
and uh, uh, getting a feel for what that person, whether it might be a fit for First Baptist. Uh, do the meet and greet if we can in person. We're, we're getting resumes from Florida to California, so it's not always possible, but, uh, but we'll, we, we want to get to know this person. The, this, what we're seeking to do as a team is to come up with a unanimous uh, decision to next step could be to, to invite as a guest speaker. And that guest speaker at that point in time is still an applicant only, has not been endorsed by our team to be the, uh, the be candidate for our senior pastor. So he's still an applicant. Uh, at the point in time of a guest speaker, as you know, we, we could make an inv invitation and we look for our congregation to have feedback. So that's the purpose of the little cards or little sheets that we've supplied to give you the chance to, in writing, submit your opinions and, and what you think of that speaker at that time. Still not a, still not a, a candidate for the position. Still simply an applicant. Still trying to, to uh, you know, looking for your prayers, looking to uh, go through the process. So it, it's, a, it's a drawn out process. So the backgrounds to be checked, uh, more references, uh, and then ultimately a possible call after we have a unanimous decision from the team a possible call for a candidate to be our senior pastor. So I just wanted to make, take a few minutes to, uh, to make sure everybody understands that process. Certainly if you have any questions, please call me, call, call any of the team. Uh, news for you. Todd Hartley, Dr. Todd Hartley was here last Sunday of April, I think, so it's been a month, uh, I guess, now ago. Todd spoke, uh, had a good day in church with Todd. Uh, Todd and I had a conversation this past week and we mutually agree that, uh, that God is just not working with Todd and Sue or with our church to, to, to make that happen. So Todd has, has gone on and uh, at this point in time will not be considered as an applicant. Now, going forward, the blessing is we've got, we've got a nice stack of resumes. And uh, so next week, it's a week from today, right? June 4th, June 4th is Kent Maitland will come as an applicant. He is gonna guest speak that day. So please come with your ears wide open and, uh, and prepared. Uh, be sure to use the evaluations that are that are available. I believe they've been placed on the tables at each entrance and should be boxes to collect those. We'd love to have your input. The more the better. Uh, it's your voice and your, your chance to uh, give us an idea of what you think of these speakers. Do they relate? Do you, can you hear them? Did they dress right? Have the right haircut? The whole deal. So tell us what you think. Um, so give us your feedback, search team. Uh, if, if we could gather today for just 15, 20 minutes in Mike Murray's uh, Sunday school room after service would be great. I know we got a lot going on, but uh, I, I won't take much of your time, but please join us. Thank you all and keep praying. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have one question, Stan. Did you get your hair cut to come up to make that announcement today? <laughs> A good trim. All right. So we are grateful to be together in God's house. Amen. Amen. I want you to repeat a couple verses of scripture with me. They are from Psalm 100 today. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Come before him. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. And his courts with praise. 
give thanks to him and bless his name. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Father God, today is going to be a wonderful day in your house. Father, I thank you that you have First Baptist Church of Monroe firmly in the palm of your hand, Father. We know that the church's future is secure and the footsteps of Jesus are set before us. We simply need to follow your leading, Lord, and I pray that in every way we will do that. Father, in ministry, in pastor search, in every aspect of our church's outreach, Lord, set the steps before us that we will follow you. Father, bless Vacation Bible School long before it has begun. Lord, we pray that you will bless those days that we will share together, especially in the lives of children, Lord. Many children make decisions for Jesus in Vacation Bible School Week. So, Father, we just pray for your will to be done. I pray for willing workers, for volunteers to come to help. Lord, help us to just have a Bible school that honors you and that reaches lives for Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that we meet on Memorial Day weekend. As we gather here, Lord, it's so good to see so many in church. I know many travel on this kind of weekend and that's kind of considered the doorway to summer. And yet, Father, help us to remember how sacred this weekend is, how sacred Memorial Day is, as we remember those soldiers throughout the wars that have been fought uh, for our country, Lord, those soldiers that have fallen and given their lives the ultimate, uh, the ultimate sacrifice that we might be free, that we might be a free people and that we might be free to worship. And so, Father, today, thank you for allowing us to stand on the shoulders of those soldiers who gave the ultimate sacrifice that we might be free to come to the doors and to the sanctuary of the church to worship you, Lord. We thank you for this weekend. We thank you for uh, all those who have served you in any capacity over the years, Lord, in armed services. We pray your blessing on them. We pray your blessing on families that today have an empty chair around the table. But, Father, today, as we gather, we thank you that you're Lord of all, and we thank you, Father, that you will bless everyone who comes before you asking for uh, your, your touch on their lives. So as we gather here, Father, we pray your touch on us as we worship you in the spirit and in the truth of Jesus Christ. Thank you today. We will see the joy of baptism. We know, Lord, today is going to be a wonderful day in your house, and we give it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 297, I Love to Tell the Story.
Our next hymn this morning is 441, Take Time to Be Holy. when you sing those hymns that you pay attention to the words sometimes the words kind of flow through but I wanted you to, to notice the last sentence or the last uh, phrase in that verse uh, that song that we just sang it says that we are going to be suited now for service above one day which means the ministries that we do now are a shadow of the ministries that we're going to do in heaven uh, you're not going to sit on a, a cloud and pluck a rusty harp. That's not our goal in heaven. Uh, but actually, in the book of Revelation, it says his servants, who are us, will serve him while we're there. So he is teaching us now ministry here so that we will also be able to serve him there. So I'm grateful that we can give our lives, give our hearts in service and in love and in worship today. And part of worship is prayer. Uh, worship would be entirely incomplete without prayer. And so today as we come before the Lord as a praying people, there are some prayer concerns that uh, I'm sure are just at the, at the very surface of all the prayer concerns we have in the church. But a few I mentioned, Buddy and Hilda Mayberry, a uh, home, but uh, both of them not really well. We pray for them. Aileen Young in Liberty Ridge Therapy. Uh, also Mary Cumby, who is home, but we want to pray for her. I uh, just ask God's blessing, strength upon her. Pam Thomas uh, is still in the hospital, but my understanding is she is doing better, but she is still in the hospital. Becky Bryant is on my list, but she is here today, and we're grateful, Becky, to have you here. Uh, and also, uh, an, a, an unspoken concern, all of us should be praying for and lifting up our children. It doesn't matter if they're toddlers or infants or grown and gone. We should be praying for our children every day. And uh, I want us to pray for a precious daughter represented right here in this sanctuary today, uh, asking God's blessing upon her. Again, I know that there are many, many other prayer concerns uh, in our midst today. So I'm going to give you a moment of silence and you lift up your joys, needs and concerns before the Lord and I'll join us together in prayer. So may all of us pray together. Our Lord God, thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. Thank you, Lord, that you promise us that every prayer need, it doesn't matter how minor or major we think it is, every prayer need is heard. 
And every prayer is answered, Father, in your time, in your way, and in your wisdom. For that we're grateful. If we were the ones who answered our own prayers, uh, life would still be in a bad direction because we don't know the infinite mind of God. And we thank you, Father, that when we give a prayer, we are to release that prayer and that need completely to you for you to answer it in your right way, Lord. Sometimes your answers baffle us. Sometimes we don't understand all the answers of God. But we know in the end, all will be right because you're the one who is in control. And so, Father, we give you our needs today. We give you our joys today. We thank you for life today. Father, we thank you for lives that were lost through the wars uh, of our country, Father, so that our freedoms might be preserved. And as Joan Stanley reminded me this morning, uh, some very precious friends were lost in his life. And I'm sure that there are so many in this sanctuary today and those who are watching with us online who can recall a precious brother or sister or a mother or father or someone who was a dear friend over life who was lost in a war. My son lost a very dear friend, a very young man, uh, Taylor Miller, uh, when he first went into to service, Lord. And so I know that there are so many who have lost precious ones over the years of life. Father, we pray your blessing on those families and we pray your blessing on our hearts. And Father, we just thank you for those who gave the ultimate sacrifice that we might be a free country and that we might be able to worship freely. We thank you, Lord. That is a privilege. Uh, it's not a right. It's a privilege. And we thank you, Father, for that privilege that you have given to us that we might worship you freely. Lord, today as we come, thank you for letting us lift up all of our prayer concerns. And, and Father, we thank you that you will answer each one in your time and in your way. Father, as we gather here today, we thank you for uh, our past. We thank you as we look back for your blessings on our past, Father. Uh, we were able to get up and uh, come to church today, Father, or to join church by uh, Internet, Lord. However someone comes to church, thank you that you have made it uh, a day that we might worship you, Father. Thank you for every blessing that you've given us in days past. But also, Lord, we gather before you to thank you for the blessings that we will receive today and the blessings that will come day after day because we belong to you. Father, we know that that is true. You take care of your children. And Father, if there's one person listening today or seated right here in this sanctuary today who has never come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Father, that is the first move of life that brings all of those blessings to be in us, including a home in heaven. And so, Father, I pray if there's one who has never made a commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today is that day for him or for her. Father, we thank you that as we open your word of God, it absolutely speaks to us every time we open it to read a verse or a chapter. Uh, and I thank you today, Father. I'm going to preach on one verse of Scripture. It is more than enough for a sermon. But I pray that you will speak to us as the word uh, is given to us and as the bread of life is broken to us. Lord, bless us as we worship you today. And we know that this moment sets the course of our week. We want to leave this place to honor you, represent you, and be a missionary in the force of Jesus Christ in this world. Lord, use us in mighty ways in this week to come and prepare our hearts in this hour that we might go to serve you. We love you, thank you, and we're grateful to be your people. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
While the children are going out, let me say to you that uh, last week I met with the children after lunch. Do you remember that was going to happen? Uh, they fired questions to me for about an hour and a half. Isn't that about right, Jessica? Uh, and it was a wonderful meeting. I mean, some deep questions uh, about the cross and about free will. Uh, it was really good, and I want you to know in that hour and a half, we never one time had to say settle down or pay attention. They were with me the whole time, and that was an amazing thing, so I hope we can do it again. Somebody asked if there's going to be an adult version of that. <laughs> I don't know if that'll be easier or harder, to tell you the truth, uh, but a good day in God's house, and I'm grateful you are here today on this Memorial Day weekend. I want you to take your Bible. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. And uh, as uh, you have been here with me, you know we have walked step by step through this book of the Bible. Today actually is, is uh, sermon number 17 out of a total of 18 sermons. So the next time I preach will be the last sermon uh, in the book of Philippians. And then if you want to start studying a little bit, we're going to start the book of James which is a great study of the Word as well. So that's where we're headed. Uh, for those of you who may be joining us, maybe for the first time or it's been a while, I want to remind you this letter uh, is a letter that was written by St. Paul. He was in prison at the time, uh, about 60 A.D. He was in Rome. The church was 600 miles away in the city of Philippi. If you remember, this is the first church established in the continent of Europe. So it's a very important uh, church in the continent to this day. All the Christians of Europe can hearken back to those first Christians in Philippi. We're going to study one verse today. Paul is writing this letter. He loves this church. And his main message to the church at Philippi is keep on keeping on. Because you're a great church, you're doing a great work, don't falter in that work. And he's giving them direction as to how they can best keep on keeping on. So we're going to look at one verse of Scripture today, and it's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. There is enough information in this one verse of the Bible. I could preach many more than one sermon out of this one verse because of all that it says, but I'm going to condense it down today. But it deals with a Christian's heart and the child of God's mind. And how important that is. You know, we learn in Sunday school as, as David looked at Bathsheba, you know what happened in that a gross immorality was committed, but it was committed first in his mind as he looked at her from one housetop to another. There's where the immorality began. It did not begin in the physical act. It began in his head, and it led to the physical act. We have to see that as a basis that is true for every single one of us as we look at our own faith. This is an elemental point of our faith that I want you to, to catch with me today. Being a Christian, being a believer, does not begin with what we do. It begins with what we think. It begins with what we believe, and belief leads to action. So what is in our mind and in our heart is what leads us to do what we do. It all begins with the mind and the heart. A few years ago, in fact, at this point, it was many years ago, a local funeral home called me one day, and the funeral director said, a man who lived in Amherst County many, many years ago moved away. He lived in another state most of his life, but he passed away, and they're bringing him back to Amherst County to be buried and very few people know him. This will be a very small service, but would you conduct a graveside service for this man and for his family? And I said, absolutely, I'll be glad to do that. The funeral director told me, somebody from the family will be in touch with you to discuss the graveside service. So the day before the funeral, a relative called me, and she was telling me the kind of service that she wanted. And basically what she said is, I want you to present a service of comfort and assurance for the family. And I said, that's my heart. That is absolutely what I would want to do. But I'd like you to tell me a little bit about the man who passed away. Uh, she said, well, he was good to his family. He did a lot of good things for other people. He was simply a good person. And so I asked her, I said, well, was he a Christian? Was he a believer? Did he have a connection with church? Was he uh, involved with the Lord? And as we ended the conversation, she simply said, no, 
I don't know that he ever darkened the door of a church. I don't think he ever made a commitment to Jesus as his Savior. But I want you to give us a service of comfort and assurance. Well, there's a problem. What could I assure her of? What could I assure this family of? When they didn't know that he ever made a commitment to Christ, he was never involved in the church, what was I to assure them of? I had no basis to assume that he was in heaven with the Lord. Perhaps he made a decision in that last five minutes of his life. I pray so. But I didn't know that. And I will not make a promise that I do not know, even in a funeral. And so that day, the only thing I could truthfully say was, he lived a life of helping other people and he was a, a good neighbor, but I could not give any eternal hope in that graveside service because I didn't know that it existed. I pray it does, but I didn't know that to be a truth, a fact. You see, the lady that I talked to gave me a faulty assumption. Here's the assumption she was working on. This man did good things. And because he did good things, God approved of him. And because God approved of him, that means that he has a home in heaven. And that is absolutely faulty logic and faulty thinking when it comes to exactly what the Word of God says. It's not what you do. It begins with what you believe. It begins with knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Many people in our country today, many people in our world want to believe that just being a good person is enough to bring you to God's glory in heaven. But I want you to remember what the Bible says about that. In Romans 3, 10, it says there are none righteous. No, not one. And also in Isaiah 64, 6, one of the verses that I think about so often, it says that, that all of our righteousnesses, if you put the best things that we do as people, if we could gather them all together, it says all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags before God. The very best we can do is just not good enough to earn us forgiveness and heaven. And that's what the Bible teaches. There's no basis in the Bible for personal goodness bringing us to forgiveness before God. In fact, the Bible's entire message is summed up very well in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works or being a good person, lest any man should boast. We have nothing to brag about. It's all based on the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness of God in our life through Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and took our sin there and rose from the grave to promise us eternal life. It's not what you do. It's what you believe. So the Bible's plain that God's gift of love and salvation begins with an act of grace before God that we come to Jesus as Lord and Savior and give our heart and our life to Him. You have to accept Jesus in order to begin a life of pleasing God. Pleasing Him begins with knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the beginning. That's the necessary first step to a life of honoring and worshiping God is giving your heart to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Okay, then after that first step, once you receive Jesus as Savior, then His Holy Spirit comes to live in you and in me. And when that happens, that's where our Scripture picks up today. When you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you have placed your heart and your mind and your soul in His hands, that's where Scripture picks up today. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Look at that verse. It's a very important verse. If Jesus lives inside, then you fill your insides with thoughts that honor and please Him. If Jesus has cleansed your heart of the filth of sin, then we can't think of anything that, that drags the filth back into our life that He's already forgiven us of. We have to center our minds and our hearts on godly things. That's what Paul is saying here. If the Lord lives in you, you want to have a clean living space for him, don't you? I do. We want to have a clean living space when the Holy Spirit lives in our heart. So we need to clean out the filth, not bring it in. No more than we want to let Jesus live in filth than you want to go home to a pigsty today. So it's important that we keep a clean mind, clean heart, clean life before him where he lives in us. So Paul in one verse gives a list of eight things 
that needs to fill the believer's mind. They are to occupy our heart and they affect what we do for the Lord Jesus. So look at Philippians 4 verse 8. It says this, finally, so Paul is getting close to the end of his letter. So he's summarizing everything that he said. Finally, as he sums it up, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things things. Keep these things at the forefront of your mind and your heart. Now, if you take a little note, it might be good for you to do so. I'm going to go through all eight of these. It won't take long, but I want you to listen and hear what Paul is saying, because these are the mind fillers that we're to experience day by day as we live for the Savior. First of all, he says, fill your mind with whatever is true. Now, I can give you all the Greek words, Jessica, I'll meet you afterward and give you the list. But all the Greek words are pointing, whatever is true, it means that you don't conceal and you don't hide anything from God. You are filled with complete truth and transparency before God. Think on how you're going to give your life and surrender to your life and, and, and giving your life to the Lord. If there's anything God hates, it is lying. It is untruthfulness with him and with others. In fact, in Proverbs 6, verse 17, it says there are seven things that God considers an abomination to him. And one of them is lying, untruthfulness. So Paul says, church, center your mind on truthfulness with God and with your neighbor. Think in truth always and always tell the truth in all situations. Be truthful with God and truthful with one another. Here's number two. Christians are to fill their minds with honorable, honest things. The Greek word here is semnos, and it simply means you're going to be honest with God in all things. I believe foremost that means as we're honest with God, we need to tell him everything about our life. Now, it is true in the Bible that God knows us through and through. He knows us cell by cell. In fact, it says that even before a word arrives on our tongue, lo, Lord, thou knowest it all together. He knows everything about us. He, never, he knows every thought. He knows every feeling. He knows every emotion. And yet, he wants us to come to him and tell him those things. And so... Paul is telling the church, be honest with God. Don't hide any sin problem from God. He already knows it. You remember Adam and Eve hiding in the garden after they had sinned? And God is walking through saying, where are you? He knew exactly where they were. And yet he wanted them to come clean in their sin. He wanted them to come before him in their sin. Don't hide a sin problem from God. Be honest with him in all things. And also be honest in your relationship with people. Be honest with your family. Be honest in the workplace. Be honest on your taxes. Be honest in all things. Above board. Be truthful. Be honest in all things. That's what Paul is telling the church. Good advice. Good counsel for us. Complete honesty might not always be easy. But it will always be right. Number three. Paul says, Christians, you are to think about being just. That means to be innocent. The Greek word is diakonos. Or rather, I'm sorry, not diakonos, dakaios. And it means to be innocent from wrongdoing. In every action, in every thought, ask God if he approves. You remember back maybe 20, 25 years ago, there was a big movement of WWJD. What would Jesus do? You remember that? That's pretty much what we're saying here, is in all things, we would ask the question, what would Jesus do in this situation? I want to be just in all things, being innocent of any wrongdoing before God or before man. Being just before God is important. Number four. Paul says, Christians, we are to think about pure things. Greek word is hagnos. And this area is about all things, being pure in all things, in all our dealings with, uh, with people, in our worldly dealings. We're honest, we're pure in all things. But it especially deals with our sexual outlook. 
and that part of our life. Our thoughts toward others, particularly of the opposite sex, are to remain pure. That's what Paul is telling the church, and those words are absolutely important for the church today. You remember the 10th commandment. It is in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, that it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house or his wife or his servants or his livestock or whatever. Be pure in the way you think about people. Don't let your mind become greedy and desirous of things that other people have. Be pure in your thoughts toward other people, particularly in that realm of your life that deals with sexuality. That's the direction that word leads us. All right, here's word number five. We are to fill our minds with lovely things. Whatever is lovely, think on those things. Well, the best definition I can give you there is from Psalm 84, verse 1, and it says this, How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. So when we dwell on lovely things, that means we're thinking about the things of God. We're thinking about the church fellowship. It is a lovely thing that we're doing right now, that we're in fellowship together as brothers and sisters in Christ and that we're studying the Word of God. That's a lovely thing. This is where God is. Amen? And He meets us here, and because He's meeting us here, wherever the Lord is, is a lovely place. If you get out in nature, you look at the stars at night, or you look at the beauty of God's creation, that's a lovely thing because it came from the hand of God. So we are to think on the things where God is. A good friendship based in the Lord Jesus Christ is a lovely thing. Because that friendship based in the Lord goes far beyond just a high hello, your brother or sister. And we're going to walk together in the highs and lows of life. Think on those lovely things where God is. Now, I do realize that we live in the real world. And when you turn on the news, you're going to hear about tragedy. And you're going to hear about violence. That's just the way the world is. So we have to think about those things at times. We have to think about the nuts and bolts of life. We have to think about paying our bills and keeping the house up and doing the laundry and making supper and all those things that we do day by day. Those nuts and bolts things are just part of life. Sadly, the news about violence and tragedy, part of life. But what brings us back on center is thinking about the lovely things of God. It keeps our mind on track as where we need to be as we deal in a world that is not always easy. The lovely things bring us back on track to where we need to be. Sixth, Paul says we're to fill our minds with whatever is commendable, or King James Version says, of good report. Think about the good things that happen around you and among you. And I can say this, one of the ways that we can keep our minds on track is to think about the good things that are happening in our church family and in our church ministry, the good things that are happening here. And I'm going to ask you to do this, and I want to contribute as well. I want you to be one who contributes to your church to make it a place of good things, to make it a place of good ministry, to make it a place of good outreach, to make it a place when a visitor comes through those doors that immediately they feel welcome and they feel the presence of Jesus. That's you and me making good things happen by the definition that Paul gives the church at Philippi. Be a church that is commendable. Be a church of good report. When you're in public, speak good things about your church. When you're out there and you have a, a, an opportunity to say something about your church, invite people to come because this is a great place to be. Speak good things. Make your church commendable to the world outside of these doors. You and I can do that. Our church needs to be a place of good report, a place that is commendable, according to Paul. Now, I'm going to combine words 7 and 8. The last two words, Paul says, Christians, think on things that are morally excellent and worthy of praise. And both of those Greek root words mean think on things that God would approve of. Think on things that commend God's love to others. Fill your mind with godly thoughts and fill your mind with godly words. Think about others in the right way. Think about how to communicate God's love in the right way. Okay, well now that we've gone through those eight things that are mind fillers for the believer's life, here's Paul's point in bringing all this up. We will do what we think about. 
So when you fill your mind with those good things, being truthful and honest and commendable and of good report, and you fill your mind with all of those things, it will then point you to directions of how to serve the Lord and how to live your life in a way that honors Him in all things. So Paul is saying we are to reflect what the Lord has put in us in the way that we live. We're to think on those things so it guides our outward actions. Jesus put it well in Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 and 35. He said this, For out of the abundance of the heart, so in other words, Jesus says, What's inside, what's in your heart, what's in your mind, from out of the abundance of the heart, the good man out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. What's inside will come out. If it's good, it will come out in what you do. If it's evil, it will come out in what you do. That's what Jesus said, and it is absolutely the Word of God. So Paul says, fill your mind, fill your life with good things, because that will then give you the track that you'll be living on and how you will live your life. And the big point is this. If you don't live for the Savior, if you don't show the Savior, then lost people will never see the Savior. Church, live for the Savior inside these doors and outside of these doors. Think the good things. Put the good things in your mind, the things that honor and uplift God, and that will set the track as to how you'll live outside of these doors. I want to give you one scenario that is absolutely true. It's been studied and proven over and over again. It comes from the mid-1700s, and it deals with two men. The first man, his name was Max Jukes. He lived in the state of New York, he did not believe in Jesus Christ. He filled his mind with thoughts of alcohol and women and gambling. He nor his family ever darkened the door of a church. They never took in the word of God's forgiveness and love for any of them. Max Jukes was the leader. He was the patriarch. He didn't believe in any of those things. And he only wanted to live for evil in his day. They've studied his bloodline. They've studied his family. Max Jukes had 1,026 descendants. And out of his family, 300 were in prison, an average of 13 years apiece. 190 were prostitutes. And 680 were admitted alcoholics. And seven were murderers. And it all harkens back to the patriarch of the family who lived for evil and set the track for the rest of his family. Now, the other man, his name is Jonathan Edwards. If you've studied history, I think you would know that name. Jonathan Edwards lived in New York State at the same time. He loved the Lord. He filled his life with prayer. He studied the Word of God. He preached the Word of God. His thoughts were always about reaching others for the Lord Jesus Christ, primarily his family. He had 11 children, and he prayed over his children day by day. He took them to church. He taught his children, and he led his family in serving the Lord. And over the course of time, Jonathan Edwards had 929 descendants. 430 of them were ministers in the church. Eighty-six became university presidents. Seventy-five of them authored books on godly topics. One of them actually became vice president of the United States. His name was Aaron Burr. He served under Thomas Jefferson. But what I want you to see is there was so much difference between those two families as they hearkened back to one man, the one who led that family and established the bloodline of that family. And those families either praised God and served the Lord or got in trouble over and over again because the patriarch put his mind to good things and evil things. Nothing has changed from the 1700s to today. We are setting the track that our families are going to live by. And it's important that we keep our mind on godly things. So Christian today, truthfully, what occupies our minds during the week? What's your treasure? What do you want to pass on to your children and your grandchildren and this community and your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers? What, what do we want to pass on? What footprint do we want to leave on earth when we're gone? 
Well, again, we have to think about things of the world, but what possesses us? What is our treasure? I pray it's the good things of God. That the Word of God is in our mind and in our heart and that we study it daily and that we take it in and allow it to change us and direct us. I pray that you give thought to the privilege of worship and the privilege of prayer and the blessing of friendship, especially with your brothers and sisters in Christ and the purity of life and the ministry that the Lord has given to you and me. And every one of us is a minister. He calls some of us behind the pulpit as preachers. But I can tell you this, in your life, believer, now you have to be a believer for this to be true, but if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you have talents through which you are to serve Him. It might not be behind a pulpit or as a Sunday school teacher or a missionary to Africa, but in some way, you're going to serve Him. You're going to represent Him in your circle, especially in your family. You're going to represent Him well. My prayer is that you will do that. So today... Brothers and sisters, those of us who know Christ, will we say, Lord, help my mind, help my mind to belong to you. Help me to think on the things that are going to bring godly action through my life. Lord, I pray that you will set the course in my mind and my heart that my ministry outside of these doors as well as inside of the church will belong to you. And that I will be leading others to see Jesus and know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Fill me, Lord, with those kinds of thoughts that I can serve you well. Help me focus on you at work, at home, at church, wherever, wherever I am, that I might belong to you, that I might lead others to you. God has a divine plan for every single one of us. And it begins in your mind, and it will come out in your actions. I pray that you and I will rededicate our lives to giving our mind and our heart to the Lord Jesus. And that we will live for him every single day. Now, last point. If you're here today or you're watching on internet today and you have never given your heart to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, let me say this to you. You might live the best life you possibly could live, but it will never be of the merit to stand before the holiness of God. The very best any of us can do are like filthy rags before His holiness. But I want you to remember that He paid the ultimate price for you. The perfect Lamb of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God Himself died on the cross that you and I might be forgiven. That we can give our mind and our heart to the Lord Jesus and ask Him to fill us with His Spirit and then ask Him to fill us with the good things of His Word and life, that we might serve Him, that we might live for Him, and that we will live with Him for all eternity. Before you can give your mind to God, you first have to give your heart to Him as Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, He's waiting on you. He's moved the mountain for you, that today you might be forgiven. He's done what you and I cannot do. He lived the perfect life that we might be forgiven. And He died a sinner's death in my place and in your place. If you need Him, you come to Him. Church home, whatever you need, the Lord Jesus meets us here. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, as we come today, we thank You that our minds as believers belong to You, Lord. When You paid the price for us and we accepted You as our Savior, Father, You, you purchased our lives on the old rugged cross. You gave us freedom through the empty tomb. And so, Lord, today I pray that all of us belong to you and our minds should belong to you. Our heart should belong to you, Lord, that we want to think on the things that bring you honor and glory, that we might commend you to others, Lord. I pray that for First Baptist Church of Monroe, that we will live in such a way as a congregation that we will commend Jesus to this community and to the world outside of these doors, Lord. Help that first-time visitor to walk through these doors and feel the welcome of Jesus Christ here. We want to commend the love of God to anyone who joins us. And we want to commend the love of God to those who are outside of these doors, Lord. We will, pass, we will cross paths with so many people this week. All of us in different areas of life will see so many people. Help us to commend Jesus to them by the way we live. And the way we can live to commend Jesus to fill our minds with the Word of God and the good things of God. Help us to surrender our minds to you, Lord. And if there's one who has never received you as Savior, I pray today that he or she will know that 
though they'll never be good enough on their own, they will be forgiven and given eternal life and the grace of God when they receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is your promise, and you've never turned anyone away who has sincerely come and asked to be forgiven. Today, that is absolutely true, Lord. I pray that you bless that one who needs you. Thank you again, Lord, for loving us, for providing a church home. If someone needs a church home, it can be right here. But bless us, we pray. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Before we enter into that moment of decision, uh, we have a young lady, Kylie Butler, who is going to be baptized today. And I understand that there is a wonderful gift that she is going to receive today. And that is a white towel, which symbolizes the white robe of forgiveness. So I'm going to ask Brian Claybo, who is here today. Come up here with me, Brian. I know you've done this before. Uh, it teaches us in God's Word that the saints of heaven are clothed in white. And so this white towel represents the whiteness of the robe. As Kylie has given her heart to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and Brian will allow you to present that to her. I know you've done this before. Absolutely. She gonna come up? Where is she at? Okay, that's all right. Is she gonna get it later? Now? She's gonna get it now. But I'm gonna wait till she comes in here before I embarrass her. Do that. Yeah. 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 All right. You do that. Thank you, brother. Glad you're here. So we're going to wait on her, or we're just going to proceed? She's coming up right now, yeah. yeah. She's coming. Okay. While she's coming up, I'll just say, you know, this is, um, this is an exciting time in the life of the church. And I'm just going to say that there are many people in this room that have played a role in this. And I think BJ is going to be the one that gets to dunk her. But, but many of the people in this room have played a role in her faith development. And her coming to understand and know, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's VBS, whether it's just being here on Sunday morning, maybe it's children's church, nursery even, you know. And so we celebrate today this moment of recognizing that that investment in her life turns to fruit, Amen. spiritual fruit. And so we can look and we say, look, this is part of what the church is about. This is, this is like the Super Bowl of the church right here, right? Amen. And so we're excited about that. Come on over here. <laughs> it's public embarrassment time. Look, this is a white towel, like Brother Mike said, that represents the whiteness that Christ washes us clean. And Christ pays the penalty like he mentioned before, and so all the mess and all the ugly of sin, Christ washes off, and we get to stand before a holy God, spotless and blameless. And so that's what this towel represents. And you get to use that as this reminder um, it's a gift from the church, so you can remember this day. And it's also a timely gift, because you're about to get wet. And you're going to want a robe. So that's why it's a towel and not a robe, because you're going to want to dry off. But we're excited about that, and excited to see you're baptized today. Um, I think we need to do one other thing, if we haven't already. You, you need to do that, too, with the... Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Hey, um, for all of you here today, I'm not a member, so I just pretend like it's him saying it or something. But um, we... On the profession of her faith in Jesus Christ and on a baptism today, I want to hear a motion that we accept her as a believer in this family and as a member of this church. Is there a motion? Thank you. Is there a second? All in favor? Any opposed? Awesome. We're excited about that. I think uh, you're going to go on out that way. We'll leave you to Thank you, brother. Thank you. Good job. So as we allow Kylie to get ready for baptism here, we're going to have a, a moment of decision. We're thankful for her decision. We're thankful to recognize that decision. Maybe someone else here today needs to make a decision for the Lord Jesus. So we're going to have a few moments uh, to offer a, a time of rededication that we surrender our minds and our hearts to the Lord, that our actions might please Him. If you need Him as, as Savior, you can come today. Church home, whatever you need. Jessica's going to lead us in this moment of rededication. Let's stand together. Sing hymn 294, Set My Soul Afire.
says three times in a father's life when you're proud of your daughter. One, when you get to hold her when she's first born. Two is when she confesses. And three is when she's baptized. Well, luckily enough, I get to do the baptismal. So I can't tell you how proud I am. I'm trying not to choke up now. So, Kylie, come in here. Because you're a mission of faith by voice, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you that we go under the grace of God. And it is in Jesus' name we pray again. Amen. Amen. God bless you.